ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತೋ ಸಮ ಸಂಬುದ ನಮೋಥ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತೋ ಸಮ ಸಂಬುದ ನಮೋಥ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತೋ ಸಮ ಸಂಬುದ ಸಾಧು 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 Well, they can't say I don't have good sound effects anyway. <laughs> okay, so how are you all doing? I I want to hear about how things are going. How how are you doing, Chi? How are you? <laughs> Who's going to tell me how they're doing, huh? Yeah, you doing okay in the lockdown? It's okay. Yes, okay. And when something happens making you very angry, you're saying, "Never mind. Anicha." <laughs> okay? And you remember Anicha, you let it go by and then everything will be okay. Why? Why will it be okay? Because it's going to change. That's right. Last week we looked at um the umbrella <laughs> the umbrella drawing and we talked about uh in the umbrella drawings kind of detail is hard to do it on a small board but i'm trying to learn how to do this on a small board cuz i usually have a big a big white board to do this and i can really draw you know so it's a little difficult but the umbrella picture for those of you who didn't see it if you were not here we had um an umbrella and then it had uh the eight parts of the eightfold path on the top of the umbrella you see but above that it had the five precepts and the five precepts are very important because they shelter you So what do they shelter you from? The five precepts are sheltering you from the five hindrances which are actually wonderful because in certain suttas there's the main basic ones are five, okay? But uh when you start to look at these hindrances and go through the suttas and you're learning about them, you're going to find a sutta with the seven another one with nine one with 11 one with 16 you see and there are five basic ones with sub components that come out of those and then if you're practicing twim if you just write down twim uh and then you draw a line underneath twim we have uh you practicing the brahma viharas for a particular reason this was done uh, a lot and the monks were required to uh do this with the learning of the sila uh, they were initially if they came to practice with the older teachers very old teachers you know i know some of them in sri lanka and um they would be using breathing meditation first then they would tell them to forgive everything and they i'm not sure how they were doing their forgiveness but they had to spend a couple weeks looking at forgiveness and forgiving everything in they can remember everything they're angry about or depressed about or overcome uh with what's happened in their life and they have to let go of grudges and jealousies and things like that let them go now we have a little different way of doing this uh in the forgiveness we'll go into another lesson but they do that first and then when they come they're definitely doing breathing meditation when they first start and the breathing meditation everyone will agree with the who teaches the breathing or who starts a person is that breathing immediately it will calm you down immediately and when my own experience with bunty when i first came to washington dc and i met him at washington buddhist vihara i was 
he'll tell you I was a basket case, <laughs> emotionally wrought, no information, the world came down on me, a bunch of people died, everything was going wrong, family was angry, everything, everywhere. And um, in this situation, uh, I was also thrown into a city situation where I had an opportunity to go back to work to help my mother. And um, I went back to work, even though I was really being torn apart. And so I was not uh, very stable and very, very, uh, very sensitive to a lot of things. I didn't understand anything about feeling, about emotion, about human cognition. I didn't understand anything about this. And I certainly didn't think this was going to happen. <laughs> Becoming a mother. And then I really didn't think that was in the cards. I was going there to go back to work because my sisters couldn't go back to work. And uh, she need, my mother needed the money to be able to stay in a restaurant. So when that happened, the first thing he did was he, he gave us uh, a talk. And if you want to hear the exact same talk he gave us, you can go to any one of the, of the retreats uh, that you can go onto the website, Damasuka website, and you can look at any one of the retreats in day one. And the retreat talk, the first one will always be the same. It will give you a basic construct, a basic uh, toolbox sort of thing of information, I had never really heard this compacted information like this before ever. And the first thing he'll say to you is uh, what is a being? And he'll describe the being from the head to the foot. And he'll say the body is from the head to the foot. And then he'll say there's five aggregates that compose a being. And I'm reviewing some stuff for people who might not have heard this before. So the five aggregates are body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. Then he very quickly explains the body from head to toe, is that's your body. And don't forget your head, he'll say, don't forget your head. He doesn't tell us why he says that in the beginning, but he tells us later. And then feeling uh, is just three kinds of feeling. Just think about three kinds of feeling or two kinds is fine. Painful feeling and pleasant feeling, right? Perception, all he wants you to know is perception perceives. The word perception comes from perceiving is the verb to perceive. And a perception, that's the noun. A perception of something is naming something. And then he'll very lightly, he'll say to you, uh, with my, I have six sense doors in this body. And if I see something, the first thing when I make contact, I just see the color and form. But what it is that says when I look at this bottle, okay, what it says that uh, it, it's a bottle is perception. And you can see perception forming in the being if you have a child and you're around them between one and a half to two and a half years old. Boy, I'm telling you the vocabulary is coming duck, dog, tree, shoe, mom, dad, everything piling inside the head, building a dictionary for perception. So body feeling perception thoughts, all we're told the very beginning and it's a kind of an insult when you're suffering a lot uh, from grief and mental you know, stress. It's kind of an insult to say that thoughts, I mean, a feeling, I'm sorry, body feeling, thoughts are just thoughts and they're just arising from mind. Because usually when you're suffering and you've got a lot of suffering going on, you're thinking, Oh my gosh, this world is coming down on me. Oh my goodness, everything is happening to me. And that's not really true, but it takes a while for you to grasp that it isn't true because you really feel, I know with everything that happened to me those year or two before I was with him studying, 
it felt like God wanted to test me. <laughs> And uh, my father would say to me, nothing is going to be too hard for you to overcome in your life when I was young. I didn't buy into that, by the way. <laughs> but he would say, you just don't have to worry because if you want to collapse, just keep walking. You're not going to fall down because there's always, God is going to put a rock, you know, a piece of stone in front of you. So you can always have something to walk on. You're not going to drown in the water or have everything overcome. And we believed all this. We believed all of this. I believed. So I was thinking nothing is going to take me down. And he would tell you if you were really devastated when your dog died or, or a horse died or somebody died and you're overcome, believe it or not, your heart, it is a muscle. So it's not going to collapse. Actually, I didn't appreciate that a few times, but, <laughs> but it's true that the heart is not going to give out, but it sure feels like it when everybody's just leaving and dying, you see? So that's something that you get through. So you have body, feeling, perception, and thoughts, he says, just come up. You're not, oh, there are thinking thoughts and there are um, analyzing thoughts. And someone said, but is it okay to have any thoughts? And I said, well, in your meditation, um, a, a, to think, to, the thought arising, this is, um, what are those two words? I can't remember now, that's funny. There's the, um, the impact and then the extension. And um, maybe, maybe Ka uh, Major can help me. <laughs> That's the word uh, for Vitaka. Here you go. Vitaka Vichara. Vitaka is this one thought is coming. Thought is coming. And it's the thought happening. But the Vichara is mental proliferation and it goes farther out. It becomes Papancha. Papanch is this huge ongoing, some people will say runaway mind. In those days, I felt like the steamroller was chasing me <laughs> and it was going to just overtake me. There were so many thoughts about everything. So body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. What is consciousness? All you need to know about consciousness. Consciousness. In the aggregates, it's a, just a pool inside you of consciousness, and consciousness does what? Consciousness is the consciousness. So that's the noun. It cognizes. So in number 43 or 44, I can't remember which one, is 43 or 44, Majima Nikaya, it tells you consciousness, consciousness, consciousness cognizes. Just the way it says perception, perception, perception perceives. And when we look up what is perceiving, perceiving is naming, and what is cognizing to cognizing or cognition, the consciousness cognizes and forms cognition is understanding. Now there's understanding on all different levels. You all know this. There's understanding on one basic level when you read something, okay, I understand it. <laughs> Maybe you can take an exam and you understand it and you get an A because you have a good mind to remember. But then there are all these different depths of understanding. And so when the Buddha was teaching, he was teaching a gradual teaching a gradual practice and a gradual progress. He tells us this in 107 when he's talking to Ganika Mogalana. And Ganika Mogalana is an accountant and he's telling us about how he trains his accountants. So when you hear how he trains the accountants, ones and fives, twos and fives, fives and tens and hundreds and thousands and he teaches them how to be the best accountant. So he asked them, the Buddha, how do you teach? And the Buddha replies in a simile about Badali. Badali is the horse trainer. How do you train a young cult? And what he's saying about this that is wonderful as I can see the students 
uh, visually see the students learning and they're behaving just like the cult. <laughs> okay, so uh, the cult, he says, uh, let me catch it here. I want to read it to you because it's the horse trainer obtains a fine thoroughbred cult. And first he makes him get used to wearing a bit in his mouth, you know, a bit, because he pull on the bit to make the horse go to the left or the right. Up till then, it's like a child doing whatever it wants until you give it instruction, right? And then afterwards, he trains it further. And when uh, you train the horse that way, um, each time you give it the bit or you put something on the back or you put the rope on and start to walking around, it thrashes and turns and vacillates and doesn't do what you want it to. It moves in meditation, even though you told them don't move in meditation. They're sitting there going like this and they're changing their position and moving around. And you're walking around the meditation hall. Bunty will say, did you go around? Did you check each one? <laughs> say, yes, I checked each one. And you tell them how to sit but they still sit the wrong way or you tell them how to walk and you have to go uh, tickle them I have a stick with a feather on the end to tickle them you know if they're moving while they're meditating my favorite one is when they tell me there's no control if I just start moving when I'm meditating and they're going like this and they're you're the only one that can control the movement of your body I'm not going to come and control this. So you have to say, don't move to your body because this is just habitual stuff that's coming up sometimes from when you're meditating before or something like that. Uh, but you cannot move at all when you're sitting in meditation. We'll talk about that another time. So I wanted to get in, that's, you have aggregates, you have three kinds of feeling, you have um, the, the um, what's happening when the feeling comes up. And he talks to us a little bit about, this is where the uh, dependent origination chart that I built, you know, where it came from, why is it green and why is it, why is it gray and yellow and green and red? And it's because what's gray in the chart is ignorance. Just ignorance of what? What does it, it, does ignorance mean you're stupid? <laughs> no, it doesn't mean you're stupid. It means that you're ignoring something. And so uh, I, my question was, even after he explained what he, we were ignoring, I said, but, but um, uh, how, do you, how do you start ignoring something you didn't know existed? And he looked at me funny and he said, you see, that's true. That's why we can't say you're stupid about it. You're ignoring something because nobody ever told you about it. So how can it be your fault, right? So what are you ignoring? In, in the Buddha Dhamma, you're ignoring the Four Noble Truths. And you're ignoring uh, the Eightfold Path. And you are ignoring, uh, let's see, it's basically the uh, Four Noble Truths, Dependent Origination, and the Three Characteristics. That's what it is. Now, we put them in that order because that's in the order they get, they get presented in the text. They stay in that order. So the Four Noble Truths are there is suffering, there is a cause of suffering, there is a cessation of suffering, and there is a path to the cessation of suffering. In another place, the Buddha says, I'm teaching you something with a basis. Well, I hope so, because he was teaching the same subject for 45 years. And if he was teaching the same subject to the people for 45 years, I hope he got it organized. <laughs> And he did. He got it very organized. He didn't leave anything out. He tells us what each piece is and defines each piece. And in one sutta, he tells us what the sorrow, the lamentation, the pain, the grief, and despair are all separately. One paragraph for each one. He tells us what is the origination, what is the, uh, of the suffering, uh, and what is the suffering? What is the cause? What is the cessation? Very clearly, very clearly. So we don't have to reinvent this, but in 2,600 years, 
with a bunch of human beings around. <laughs> uh, we have this thing about we want to make it ours and we want to write our book and say it our way and everything else. And so we have all these different echoes of what this means because that's what happens. I mean, this is what happens. These are human beings. So if you ever had a birthday party, I usually say to people, have you ever had a birthday party with children there and you have a, a games to play and one of the games you play is whispering down the lane. And when you play whispering down the lane, okay, what comes out at the other end after 10 kids are told something at the one end and they turn and say it to each person? What does the last person say? It's not what was said in the beginning. This is why the Buddha tried so hard. Uh, he, he asked Ananda to have them preserve this orally. And many people don't understand what that meant, especially in the West, they poo poo it, you know. Uh, we can write whatever we want because they tried to preserve this orally and it's absolutely impossible to preserve this orally. But let's take a look for a minute about what they meant when they said that you preserve this orally. If you go to Candy, in, um, up in Candy where the Tooth Temple is, there's two temples, two groups. And in one temple, they used to have 800 monks and they were preserving one third of this book, you know, of the Majima Nikaya. They had to preserve it by memorizing it. And the whole group came every night and they recited um, the section, the one third of the book through. This is amazing that this was happening. They did the whole thing. They didn't know what ditto marks were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they were doing the whole thing and preserving that. And the way it worked is there's 800 of you and we point, to um, Yolanda, it's your turn. <laughs> and Yolanda has to stand up in front of everybody. And now I want you to recite the Anapanasati Sutta from beginning to end. Now, if you make one mistake, I'm going to raise my hand. And then you have to go back to the beginning and do it again until you get it right. So you better believe <laughs> these monks wanted to go to sleep <laughs> and they didn't stay up all night. And they did learn how to recite this and correct each other. And it was actually more kept exactly the same because of that way of preserve preservation in oral preservation happening than it was after it was written. Because as soon as it's written, I can start writing it over. And if I see I want to make it a different way, I make it a different way. And if everybody isn't checking everything and it slips, starts to slip and slide. There's a thing we have in America called the slip and slide. This is a slip and slide where you, you're going to say this or that just a tiny bit differently. Now we have an issue today with the poly going into the English, but Bhante's attempt was to teach in English Buddhism, uh, not Buddhism either. Let's make this clear that I do understand the issue between Buddhism and Buddha Dhamma. That's not the same thing at all. If you want to name the religion, you say Buddhism. If you want to talk about what the Buddha taught, you say Buddha Dhamma. I got this one when I was correcting papers at the university over in uh, Sri Lanka, and they were putting through some, uh, in some showing the, uh, oh, I, I saw all the marks that the, the professors were putting on the master's theses before we were fixing the sentences. And I said, why are they crossing out Buddhism? And they said they made a decision. And this was in, um, when I was over there, I think it was, um, I think it was 2015 or 14 or 15. No, yeah, probably 14 or 15. And um, I said, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're, we're giving them extra points if they start talking about what the Buddha taught and they call it Buddha Dhamma, not Buddhism. And you have to understand today, this makes a lot of sense because how many, you have three schools of Buddhism basically, 
Theravada, Vajrayana, Mahayana, but, but overall, you have so many, much diversity in each one of those. In America, I don't count anymore, but in 2006, we had 34 kinds of Buddhism that was functioning in the United States, separated groups, not particularly talking to each other, not work, working together on much, but different fractionalized groups and opinions and such. So what we're doing here, if you haven't been here before, is we are going back to the Buddhist, what everybody sort of agrees right now is the earliest of what the Buddha said. And we're willing to look at the, uh, go to the, um, to the Nikayas directly, which were the lessons that were taught to his own monks. And that's how we're examining things. So let's get on topic now. Let's dive into this a little bit. Okay. Um, so anyway, when you when you um, when you hear about describing in that first lesson the being and the five aggregates and the um, three kinds of feelings, six sense doors, and you hear how you can identify something from a sense door, all of a sudden you're learning something. You're learning how exactly mind is working. It gets interesting. I was always interested in science. He had me hooked the first lesson I had in the temple. But the big thing that happened to me was that night going back from the temple to lie down and go to sleep, I will never forget as long as I live because I slept like a baby sleeps. I just slept. And after I started practicing, he taught us how can we just sleep. And so it became a preoccupation, not just helping people who are dying, like we were talking about before, but helping people who are living and, and can't sleep and have them understand all this. Okay, first of all, my main beef about teaching precepts, I will bring up because I, I see some people who teach Sunday school here. I hope I see some of them, yeah. And when I was teaching Sunday school in Sri Lanka, the interesting part about it was when the precepts are in the book, my first question, of course, was where are the hindrances? And then I found out they teach them different times. And basically at that time, and this may be, I don't even remember how many years back this is, maybe four to five years back. And it hasn't changed because I saw the new program that they produced and they're now putting around the world. They're still on the idea of teaching children the precepts without teaching the hindrances with the precepts. So let's go to our, let's go to our page and pull this up. And I think I can do this. Oops. Oh, I have to bring it up. Is that right? <laughs> he does this to me every time. Dhamma Gavesi, Bunti Dhamma Gavesi can put it up or what? Or can I? Should I? I don't see. Okay, let me see. You can put I it can. up. You can share. Mm -hmm. I, I put it up from my computer again? Yes. Okay, let me let me try to do it that way. Oh, 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 oh. Um Whoops. Mm -mm. No, that's not right. <laughs> okay, now, since this is open on my computer, now I can go back, right, um, to you. Green button. Share. Uh, wait, I didn't hear anything, so Green. I come back. I don't, wait. I'm sorry, I can't. All right. 
Now I come back to you and I, because I opened it on my computer, it's there. Is that right? Yes. Okay, I got it. Okay, so you're going to be listening, but I hope if you do have a question, you will pipe up and say something or just go peep peep or something so I can get your questions uh, as we go along with this. Um, okay, so we say, what is uh, Sela? What is Sela? We start here, and this lesson about Sela is not the simplified one, but I hope we're gonna take this in as deeper this time. So Sela is about morality, but an older word that uh, they seem to still use, <laughs> and it's not a common word in the modern world, um, unfortunately right now, is virtue. And they put, they put in the, in Bhante, um, Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, Majima Nikaya, they put, they list Sila in the index as virtue. So if you're hunting for it, that's where it is, okay. Um, the older word is the, is the virtue. And this is about moral living is an important ingredient when you're attempting to purify and retrain your brain. And we've already talked about what was the Buddha doing? And if you want to get a clear picture of what this he was doing in his investigation, if you go back to 19, Dwayda Vitaka Sutta, uh, go back to the front part of that and read the first page. And when you read the first page of that sutta, you get the clear picture. Here was a person who really wanted to check out what is it like if I live um, a wholesome, in a wholesome uh, way, or if I live in a, an unwholesome mind state or a wholesome mind state. And when you see this sutta, what came up for me, because I had children and they did science projects and such, what came up immediately for me was that he's doing a science experiment. He went for a few couple weeks and lived with unwholesome mind states, and then he lived with wholesome mind states and actions. He did the two sides and he sees very clearly. It makes more sense in living your life in whatever culture you're in to follow the wholesome side and the moral side of living because you do not have the repercussions and problems that come up if you are living the unwholesome side. So he's attempting to purify and retrain the mind when he's teaching you what he's teaching you and attempting for you to experience this, but he's not coming to you as a dictatorial form or a supreme being and saying you must do this or else. He's coming to you in a different way. He's coming to you and we see not just in this sutta, but in others as well, uh, how much he, he goes back and forth between these two sides and checks this out to see what it's like. So where generosity uh, was the introductory note to the training that we talked about before, uh, the last time now, we're ongoing, uh, we're going to go forward, and this time we're going to look at the uh, concerto. So one was like the introduction to the concert, and now we have the concerto being played, and this is morality. And, and he's going to set you up, and this becomes a tool in your toolbox. The misunderstanding about the, the uh, precepts basically is that People sometimes decide in this day and time that these are something you have to keep very tightly when you're training at a retreat. But that's not it because your brain doesn't work that way. And if you're doing off from the silas during your life and you come and do a retreat, the neural pathway in your brain is not there. It's not established. And so you can't expect 
the results they're talking about in the text to happen if you're cheating on the way the instructions were and you're not doing the purification of mind all the time. So this is one thing we have to see what he was doing and how he was doing it. So don't shut the door on the morality that quickly because the morality offers a valuable ingredient for the success of your meditation. And it, it can prove, you can prove this yourself. There's two parts to sila. There's two parts. Uh, the sila is the morality training. The first part has to do with the precepts, but the second part of the precepts training has to do with the hindrances. If we miss this and decide not to connect it with children until they're nine or 10 years old, and maybe they're gonna start doing a little more meditation, and we only talk to the children about hindrances coming up in meditation, we are missing a very important opportunity to teach children that if you are uh, not following Sheila, what happens? You're missing it. Because by then, at nine or 10 years old, they're basically, their minds are formed and pretty much trained from what they have been exposed to. So I don't, there are, I don't see why this is happening. I'm still trying to get an answer and I still haven't gotten an answer from anybody, uh, whether they were Mahatera monks or, or Tara monks or whoever they were, I have not gotten an answer that makes sense to me yet. Anyway, Buddhist meditation is training method for purification and training, retraining your mind. And it, what this does is it leads you to your mind to clear thinking in the present time or present moment, step by step in the present time. And it moves towards mind's greatest potential. Now, why am I saying that? Well, because in the brain research, in the cognitive psychology and neurocognitive science, where they're hunting for where does consciousness live and sort of those sort of research, um, they, they don't know, <laughs> okay, they don't know. And um, they do know the mind has a much greater potential than we're using in modern times. They know this and they're getting closer to opening up that potential, but they want it. They're looking for ways of doing it outside of keeping precepts sometimes. And what interests me a great deal is some of the things my students have done to change their lives as a result of keeping their precepts. I'll give you an example. I have someone who was a maestro and the leader of a great orchestral uh, orchestra in a country and who was one of my students. And um, he started keeping the precepts and everything started going really right in his family. And he was, he was uh, solving problems uh, with, he was working with me for probably three years, two or three years. Um, and um, as he worked out the relationship with his mother and the relationship with his family and the relationship with his children and their relationships started to change, he really saw the benefit of keeping the precepts all the time. And suddenly he wrote me from where they lived and said, we've made a decision and we want you to know what we're doing. And we didn't quite know what this email was about until I saw what he said. Being who he was, he had been building a huge, huge music library of all the classics and composers from way back all the way up into the present time of the finest music in the world. But he wasn't paying for it. He was pirating it. And he and his wife made the conscious decision to simply take the whole thing and burn it and destroy it. And then he was going to feel better. And he did. And he wrote back to us and told us this. This was a shock to me that, you know, he was really going to do this. Another big change that happened with another student was that um, there was a surgeon and he was going to retire. And he had um, 
uh, made a decision when he did retire, he had it all planned how he was going to do it. And during his lifetime, he was a pretty famous surgeon. And, but during his lifetime, he was not somebody who went beyond his profession. In other words, he lived privately and didn't contribute to the community at all. And here he's coming to a Theravada teacher, so he's not going to a Mahayana teacher who's going to put him to work a lot with the community. But what I saw happen naturally was when he learned the practice we taught him, he changed. And he makes this announcement to me about a year and a half, almost two years into this, when he's about to close his offices. And he said he's going to retire. He's changed everything. And I said, what did you do? And he and some other doctors made a decision. They were going to do uh, a certain amount of pro bono work in the community, free work for those people who could not afford um, services otherwise. So for me, this was a shock. It was a shock to um, see him change like that. And all of a sudden, he was uh, leaning naturally in this direction. So whatever it was that happened has to do with keeping the precepts and practicing what he really loved doing was his forgiveness meditation. And after he did it for almost a year, then he moved back into his Brahma Viharas and the Brahma Viharas served him very well. Because when you're practicing loving kindness, it's impossible for the mind to think about ill will, bring up thoughts of ill will or irritation with people, you know? And when you're practicing compassion, it's impossible for you to bring up thoughts of cruelty and revenge and things like that. And when you are practicing the mudita where you are experiencing and you're you're practicing more and more of it with people to see if you can have joy coming up when somebody else is, is succeeding in something they might not have anything else to do with you but if you feel this happening inside that's the mudita joy i i don't uh Bhante and i have a funny thing about this because he we'll say it's just the joy. It's another form of the joy, but it's still just joy. And I had this experience of, wow, that's so different. I suddenly had this real outflow of happiness from somebody who was experiencing success. So I felt like that was validating the idea of mudita as an appreciative joy. And I, some of my students have had it happen too. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen amongst them. And then the last one is if you're practicing equanimity. So when you're practicing the joy, you cannot have content, discontent come up. And then when you are practicing uh, the equanimity and trying to keep it going in your life and letting that come up in your life and in everything you deal with, turning to equanimity for solutions, all of a sudden um, you cannot have, you stop having aversion towards almost anything. And he's a very dear person and his can he had a cancer that got a lot better and he's still alive and he didn't expect to be alive. And this is about six years from when we started now. And he did not, pass away. I thought maybe he had and he's still alive and, and very active. So when we look at these basic precepts first, abstain from killing or harming living beings on purpose. We say on purpose because I do not want you to get overly upset about accidentally stepping on an ant. And you may laugh at it, but there were actually students who got very, very upset by this. And I said, there's sometimes you just can't, like if you're in the desert walking around, you can't help stepping on somebody, um, you know, but what we're saying is killing or harming living beings on purpose. You certainly can figure out a way to not squash the spider and not swat the fly and eliminate 
the mosquitoes without having to kill them. You can do that, okay? So you think of creative ways, and I put that out on our list at Damasuka, and the kids went crazy with it. I think it might still be there on the, on the website if you ask David where it is. And they came up with different ways to remove a cockroach or remove this or that from the house. It was very interesting. It was wonderful because they were being so creative. Abstain from taking what is not freely given. The third one is abstain from participating in wrong sexual activity that leads to physical or mental pain for anyone. And I will explain that further. Abstain from lying, gossip, slander, or harsh language. And the fifth one is abstain from the use of recreational alcohol and drugs that cloud the mind and lead to breaking the other four precepts. So this recreational uh, alcohol, the reason we say recreational alcohol or drugs is because certain drugs are made with alcohol, okay? And they're asked to take them by the doctor. We're not saying you, you should take those. And they didn't exist in the time of the Buddha, but that's not acceptable to reject that if you need it for uh, getting better from something. But recreational alcohol and drugs is what we're talking about. So let's expand on these and try to do these paragraphs. So you do not kill or harm living beings on purpose. Observe, we're asking you to observe and acknowledge. He's asking you, the Buddha, to acknowledge how all living beings have a strong desire to live full lives. And if you want to, start watching an ant for a day and see what I mean. You'll begin to catch on. Or watch bees or watch dogs or almost any animal. And you're going to find this is true. And take a look at birds. If you have them in your yard, follow them for a couple seasons and watch their lives, how they live in what they do. Therefore, we make a conscious effort to handle even common pests by peaceful solutions rather than just killing them. And we're applying the knowledge, um, this knowledge, you learn about karma and karma, how this is working. And there'll be a lesson on karma, so I'm not gonna go into this now about karma, but when we talk about karma, we will point to some of this. Uh, advice, is to practice creative ways to living, live cooperatively with all living beings on an earthbound realm. So what does it mean to kill something? This is something everybody should learn. To actually kill something. Number one, a living being must be present. Number two, you must have the intention to kill it. Number three, you must have a weapon. Number four, you must use the weapon. And number five, the being must die. That makes you responsible for killing the being. And the reason we talk about this one, it has to do basically um, with uh, vegetarianism today and the way people would love to change the whole history of this and say the Buddha was a vegetarian, absolutely. And he wasn't. And when that was part of the problem with Devadatta, Devadatta wanting him to make everybody vegetarian, if we go back, he, he went to Jivaka, who was the, Venerable Jivaka was the doctor for all the monks, the healer and had a discussion with him. And he said he would go and talk to the Buddha. And then he goes to talk to the Buddha. And the Buddha's bottom line on this is very, very simple, okay? He was not going to be concerned about what you put in your mouth, what he was concerned to survive, to eat. Because many places you go, even in India, you cannot get vegetables or you cannot get this, or that, and you're gonna end up in parts of Asia where you will eat meat for protein, and you can't get the other foods. If you can't purchase them, you can't get them, and they can't grow there. So what he basically says is, I'm not concerned with what they put in their mouth to survive. 
I am only interested in what comes out of their mouth that causes wars. And it was a very wise statement, a very wise statement. I would say the next one is do not take something that is not freely given. This is important. A painful feeling arises. How do you feel when you have to look at you have to you have to look at this? You have to look at this and basically say, how do I feel when uh, somebody steals something from me? Yeah. And if you can, if you say that, uh, then you um, you begin to understand it's not a good idea to steal things from people because you cause a lot of mental grief and mental grief because mind is the forerunner of all states can cause physical ailments in the body and you don't want to do that because this is going to basically come around on you in the end do not commit wrong sexual activity this one is very important because we need the whole precept taught. If somebody is maybe 10 years old or older, they really need to hear this whole precept. And it should not be shortchanged by just saying, do not have wrong sexual activity. So what it really is, we must understand, is don't have sex without the permission of the partner don't have sex with a person who is too young and still living in the care of their parents or guardians. Don't have sex with anyone else's mate. And in summary, it means don't participate in anything that causes physical pain or mental grief for anyone within the act or the surrounding circle of people around you. And it's a grand lesson concerning uh, the knowledge of what you think, what you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. <laughs> this is the statement. I don't know how to get back to you all. How do we get back? Okay. Um, when you, um, okay, wait a minute. I don't know how to do this, okay. I'll just keep talking. I guess I can't get back to you. I don't know how to do it. Um, what you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future is a very fast lesson on karma. Basically means what goes around comes around. Or what you put out, you get back. There's many sayings in different languages about this. And that's the basis of understanding why karma is important to examine more deeply and see how it works so that you understand it. And once this is one of the secrets of the teaching the Buddha gave uh, was actually he believed from his own experience that when he understood how something actually works, it was easier and easier for him when I see that that's an imperfection, I abandon it. And this was in 128, we see him explain the hindrances to the monks that way in Majima Nikai number 128, I think it's in section 18, start, starts. And, and he's explaining that um, to the monks, okay? All right, now we have don't lie, use harsh language, gossip, or slander. This is the fourth precept. Now, this one also has gotten shortchanged. <laughs> and I um, was kind of shocked in some of my travels to hear, actually to hear people who shouldn't be doing, ever doing this, as using very harsh language in telling stories about the Buddha, or being very loud and raucous and guttural in the story they're telling and stuff like that, harsh. And um, the excuse was, well, if the people in the area are speaking with that kind of language and behaving that way, I'm going to teach the Dhamma that way. And that's not what we mean, not what we mean when we're talking about using the person's language 
if you can possibly learn the language to use the person's language to teach them the Dhamma. That's not what we mean. We don't mean going down as low as you can on the scale of the culture and accepting that as being uh, your, your, um, more, your, your accepted language to teach something. It's not acceptable. The reason that uh, the holy person comes is to attempt to teach in a good language how to purify and retrain your brain. So it doesn't make sense to give that as an excuse. So today, this precept is really watered down, and it's not uncommon to hear somebody say the precept simply is don't tell lies or don't lie. And that's a tragedy because today the modern uh, media legally uses lies, harsh speech, deception, and slander openly. They slander people without proof or trial or anything, slander them on the news, and they have on programs, educational topics, entertainment, politics, anything, doesn't matter. And modern marketing expects us to accept this into our culture and accept it as being right. And the bottom line here for me, as I was a professional employment counselor and placement counselor for many years, is the good companies are not going to hire you. So if you're doing this kind of thing and you get caught in the parking lot, say talking to somebody at a really good professional company, they're not going to keep you as an employee if you lower yourself to this level of speech. So people who pretend this doesn't matter, they end up suffering greatly later on. It comes back on them and all around us, we can hear this deteriorating language in the Western world, definitely, uh, reflecting a very angry population. And, and this gets, this gets uh, interesting because I made a note here for you. If you want to read this book, it's actually very interesting. I picked it up in an airport and read it. Actually, I, I surprised myself and read it very quickly, but it explains the philosophers very in simple ways what their principal things were in the Western philosophy. And then it explains why this right now is the age of anger. And his name is um, Pankaj Mishra. And the book is from 2017. It's in print now. But if you go in there, the reason I wanted this book is because when I read the description on the back, he's explaining why we are where we are right now in the world. Uh, and it helped me because I hadn't taken philosophy classes on each individual philosopher or anything like that. And so I thought it was uh, interesting that he could make me understand in, in simple terms, how did we get this way right now? And um, this is talking organically, uh, meaning the whole world, how did it get like this? So it's an interesting book to read. And um, it just, this gossip and slander, it just doesn't work. So he's, what exactly is gossip and slander has to be defined when you give this precept. So gossip is saying something behind a person's back um, and it's untrue. Without them being able to defend themselves, they're not there and slander is where somebody makes up a story and spreads a lie for the purpose of discrediting that person and to cause a division between two groups of people. A lot of times slander, we see this happen in corporations, in corporate life, because I uh, want the job with you and I don't want the other person to have it. So I start a story about that person, totally untrue. And that, fixes it so that person can't get the job. And if the person doesn't realize what I'm doing, maybe I'll get the job. And it's, it's a very sad thing because it all comes tumbling down. It catches up with you. So it's good practice to take a look at what we know when we hear something and also consider how do we know it before we take any mental, verbal, or physical action. Boy, that's really a good idea. 
to ask these questions can be a very revealing exercise. So the, the questions are, what do we know? And how do we know it before we take mental, verbal, or physical action? So we learn a lot from that precept. Do not use uh, recreational drugs and alcohol, okay, uh, or take drugs before because they cloud your mind. That's the basic lesson here. They cloud your mind, and a clouded mind opens the door to breaking the other four precepts. And originally, one historian told me there were only four precepts. I don't know how far back that goes. You can check on it. Um, so the second question here comes into play with the sila. What is, uh, the question is, what are the hindrances? The root of a hindrance is always caused, the root cause, it's the root cause of a hindrance, is always a broken precept. And you can track this like an investigator. And this can, but it can mean, it can mean, it goes back to a time in the past when you broke a precept uh, in this life. It, it doesn't matter if, if you can remember what it was or not, but also the word past could mean earlier this morning, just remember this, or it could be the fruit of some action that's further back in this life or even a past life. The result, the point is that the result of old actions uh, get locked up, the consequences of those actions get locked up inside of us. And, they, and you actually you store them at the base of the, the skull in the back of your head, the base of it, sort of the top of your neck. It's where you have a sore, sore headache there, and you don't know why that's happening. And sometimes band headaches, where they're very tight around the eyes and forehead, but it runs to the back, is coming from this. We might not even notice if uh, they're there, but then we might again begin a strange new habit that has nothing to do with this present life. This is another thing that can happen. And when one of those pops up, uh, it can cause a concern in this life. And so if I could see you guys, I wish I could see you guys. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Okay. So what you think about is, uh, I can do it. I don't know how to do it, but I, <laughs> I mumble. It's like a computer, I keep talking to myself. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to make it get big again. How do you do it? Our, our Dika, how do you do it? What is it, sister? How do you make the grid come up with all the people on it? How do you do that? Uh, I don't know there, how to do like on a top right corner, there's like a speaker view and the gallery view. Can you click on it? No, I can't see it. Uh, on the top right corner. I can't. It's all right. I wanted to see your faces, but because I'll tell you, one of the most difficult things for us, for both Bonte Vimal Ramsey and myself. Uh, he doesn't like this kind of teaching right now. I'm trying to persuade him still to try it. He's going to start doing it a little bit, but he doesn't like it at all for the same reason as I do, because he taught me to watch your faces. And if I watch your faces, I know if you are understanding or not. You don't have to tell me. I can see my students in front of me and know and pick up what it is you're not understanding when you get stuck. And then I can explain it to you. We, we don't have this, that's gone now. We can't see that. So then we can't hear your voice, just hear you say, excuse me, can I ask a question? We can't hear that either. So we can't see if you raise your hand or uh, something, just raise your hand. Yeah, but I can't see you, you see? I only see you, Ardika, and two, three other people, four other people, but I know there's four, like 30 or 40 people here. So I, I don't know how to get this back. Nope, it doesn't. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> this is very strange. Um, anyway, so I'm just going to try to keep going because we have a ways to go. 
the cause of the hindrance is always a broken precept, but you don't know where it's coming from is the point. And it's not important to know where it's coming from. One of the most interesting things about hindrances that I, I had to really work with this to prove it to myself before I could tell somebody, this is absolutely true, but you do not need to know a lot of details about the hindrance. You only need to learn how do they come up and you have to not worry about why are they here. You just need to understand how do they operate and how can they be fix it? How can I fix it so they don't come up anymore? So the question is, how do they operate? So these hindrances are like little animals, <laughs> okay? And um, when they come up, they have to be fed in order to stay and get bigger, stronger, and come back and stay longer with you they have to get fed nutriment. And that's what we're gonna look at. The bottom line here is when we begin our meditation, we agree to open our heart and release old issues and grudges and sorrows. That's what we are supposed to be doing before we train you at all. But if that doesn't happen, then these things are gonna start coming up in your uh, practice. Lust and greed, I want it mind, that leading to attachment. Number two, ill will, hatred, I don't want it mind, leading to this pushing aversion. And then what happens is you have more attachment to that one because you get attached to try to stop it. So there's a aversion and a attachment in uh, ill will and hatred. Sleepy and dull mind, I'm tired, okay? And then restlessness, guilt, and remorse is the fourth one. And then the last one is doubt. Am I doing this the right way or am I not constantly going on in the practice? Because to look at this a little bit more, let's look at lust and greed. When you look at the I want it mind, you notice there is an arising tension and preoccupation with me and my desire. You're walking in a mall, you glance in a store and oh boy, I like to watch guys when you drive them down through where all the new cars are and maybe you're hunting for a used car and they wanna stop the car, get out and start walking around and you can see them get all excited. This is car stuff, you know? <laughs> and this is where the personal idea of an individual self starts to arise. I want it. Okay. And there's a tension in that. There is a change in your mind that happens. And then when you consider why do I like or dislike something, that leads you away from the present time into a runaway thinking that we call mental proliferation. It's translated as mental proliferation. And it compounds on itself. And this kind of thinking gets bogged down by analyzing, conceptualizing multiple states, and even imagination begins happening. These kinds of thoughts become an exhausting obsession, a driving force, taking your energy away from your meditation. And then you wanna get up, walk around, move, that kind of stuff. And there will feel like a pulling sensation as mind's attention seems to be pulled away from whatever you are doing. Now let's talk about that for a minute because we are talking about the ultimate reality and we're trying to talk to you above the lower explanations for this. So when I'm doing that, let me, let me ask you a question. Is the hindrance pulling you away? Or is something else going on? Let's see how good you are. And this is where I wish I could see all of you because, um, and I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Here. I, I can't, you know, I don't want to see the list of who's here. I want to see your faces. I don't know how to get you back. Uh, click on huh? it again on the top, uh, top right corner. On the top, it says audio Stop video participants, new, share. we're in share right now. Pause share, pause the share. Your screen oh. sharing is paused, okay. But it doesn't take me back. Annotate, 
remove control and more. Disable participants, hide the, hide the floating meeting and share the computer. I don't know where it is. I just don't get it. I lost you. But my question to you is, do you understand something else might be happening? How about you, Ardika? What's happening when a hindrance comes up? When a hindrance comes up? What happens? What I'm after is the, the, the modus operandum, they call it. How does it operate? And what I'm, what I'm after here is, I'll tell you the truth, but you have to promise me that you're not going to feel guilty, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because the hindrance right. is not doing anything to you. We allow ourselves to talk to you about the hindrance in a terminology that's not really true. We allow you to think until you get to be an advanced meditator. A lot of times we allow you to think about this pulling sensation, pulling you away from your object of meditation. But if we are talking about how are you meditating and we break it down to what you do when you meditate, you sit down, you leave the world, okay? You behind and close your eyes. You bring up elements that make your meditation work and they're like mindfulness, right? If we look at this, try looking at the seven, the Bojanga for a minute, you know, we're going to bring up um, mindfulness is going to observe, okay, and we're going to do an investigation, okay, and um, we have energy happen, we, uh, we, man we manage our energy while we are uh, meditating, isn't that correct, right, okay, and so we have mindfulness and then investigation and energy and then joy comes up and then when joy fades away uh, tranquility when tranquility fades away uh, you have um, a balanced level of the concentration and then uh, uh, let's see with the balanced level of concentration then you get your equanimity you see so now let's talk about this. Here comes a hindrance. Here it comes. It's coming in and it's going in your mind. What happens now that this hindrance comes into your head? What do you do? Aha. Does the hindrance come in with a fish hook and grab your, your, your uh, observation and pull it away? Does the hindrance come in and does it stop you from your investigation? No, I do. I'm in charge of my investigation, my journey into this whole thing. I'm the explorer, you see? So what happens here is we say, first of all, you let go of your interest in, uh, let go of um, interest, Interest is the way I see it. You let go of interest in the spiritual friend, right? You let go of interest and you moved the attention over your investigation. Yeah, the investigation moved to towards the hindrance. So you moved. The hindrance didn't actually pull you. That's where I don't want anybody to get mixed up. The hindrance is not pulling you away. Okay, you are letting down your letting your meditation slip, letting your energy in your mind meditation slip, and you are moving the attention. You're in charge of moving up where the mind attention moves. We're putting you in charge of it. You place it on, you placed it on a spiritual friend. Now you took it off and placed it on a hindrance, and now you move towards the hindrance. Oh my, all of a sudden, I'm guilty, I'm to blame, I should go, you know, I <laughs> punish myself. No, no, you just have to watch closely how all this works. Because you cannot start 
inventing the dark night of the soul and saying that I am this guy and I am just been, I've been working so hard and fighting against the hindrances because they're coming to get me and they are the enemy and they are going to pull me to the bottom of the sea. That's not what's happening. You're just sitting there and you're, and you're, you're watching something, you get it? This is real important to get this difference. Because now all of a sudden, especially if you are an advanced meditator and you never heard it this way, now you can understand you're very powerful. You're completely in charge of the ship. You are completely in charge of what happens inside when this hindrance shows up and goes inside, right? Or pops up inside. So, when we believe, this is my whole spiel about this, the book I'm doing on this and everything, all right, is when, when you have this hindrance show up, if you decide it's an enemy, you are going to have to use all your energy and everything to fight it. So this is where we hear something very wrong in the commentary right up front we hear this very wrong thing you see they want us to destroy it annihilate it eradicate it suffocate it suppress it subdue it and stop it because it's coming to get us this is what it whether it was written wrong or whatever happened i don't know it's 1200 years ago but the point is it gives everybody the impression World War III is already here. <laughs> and it's the hindrance is attacking. But is the hindrance attacking or just showing up as something that pops out of the brain and appears in the person's mind? And when you understand the Bojanga completely and all the elements we tell you about your practice, how come we're not willing to step back and said, well, maybe, maybe I'm, what would happen? You should look at it this way is what I did with this was I looked at it and said, well, what if I don't fight with it? What will happen? And what if I just let it go and relax and smile and come back? What will happen? Okay. All right. Then, then we have to go into another place too with this one. Because if we go in into the uh, 1595, page 1595 of the Samyutta Nikaya, I think it is. Wait a second. Uh, um, not, yeah, Samyutta Nikaya. If we go in there to the right spot, oh boy, we're going to find something very enlightening. And everybody should do this if you have this book. If you don't, go get it, find it. Page 1597 of Bhikkhu Bodhi's Samyutta Nikaya and the discussion on this page is about, it's like about six pages long uh, because you have seven enlightenment factors. You're going to hear each one of the four sections seven times. That's why, okay. That's, the only, that's the, only, the only reason it is long is because there are seven Bojangas and um, you have to talk to each one of them in reference to the four pieces. So I'm going to tell you what the four pieces of this discussion are. I want you to write this down. Um, he says, I will teach you the nutriment and the denourishment in regard to the five hindrances and the seven enlightenment factors, seven factors of enlightenment. So what he's going to show these monks, he's going to tell them precisely and very exactly, okay? He's going to show you what the nutriments for the hindrances to come up is. Oh my gosh, this is fantastic. He's not fooling around, is he? He didn't leave this out of the training. The Buddha actually taught this part and we missed it. And so here it is. He's gonna tell you what the nutriment for the hindrance is and guess what this is verifying? What Bonte and I are trying to teach you, your personal attention. 
which is concerned in this respect when it's going to a hindrance is considered careless attention. The nutriment for the arising of an unarisen hindrance and for the increase and expansion of the arisen hindrance. What is that? There is, monks, the increase, oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. There is the, um, this, in this case, we're talking about sensual desire and the sign of the beautiful frequently giving careless attention to it. So when you're talking about sensual desire, something that is beautiful in that respect, and you start paying too much attention to it, it is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen sensual desire to get bigger and stronger and overtake you and you can't stop thinking about it. So hello to all the guys who are suffering from lust. Here it is right here. This is what's happening. Okay. And same for women, same thing. Okay. And then you have, uh, it goes over each one of the individual hindrances and talks to that about what is the nutriment and what the nutriment is in every single situation is frequently giving careless attention to it, feeds it makes it bigger, makes it stronger, makes it stay there longer, makes it come back again and again and again. I should tell you something. All right, next part of the, the discussion, the nutrients for the enlightenment factors. What is the nutrient for the rising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness and for the fulfillment and the development of that enlightenment factor? Okay. Things that are the basis for the enlightenment factor of mindfulness is frequently giving attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness. What do we say mindfulness is? Not the same as other people. We say mindfulness was the observation skill which allowed you to see the movement of mind's attention so that you could fully understand and practice comprehending uh, the Four Noble Truths Dependent Origination, the three characteristics, all right? That's what we're telling you. That's what we're getting from all of this. So paying attention to the enlightenment factor is going to make it stronger. So these enlightenment factors, you write them down, mindfulness, investigation, energy, then joy, and then tranquility, um, the balancing of your concentration to a productive, productive level, or we call this collectedness of mind and equanimity, all right? These are your pieces, your seven pieces. What is so important about these enlightenment factors? We cannot re go into the last part and in, fall into cessation. <laughs> cannot fall into Neroda without these being perfectly balanced. So you want to give them a lot of nutrition. So you have to pay attention to them. When you're in the beginning of your practice, we help you meet and greet them and you hear about them in other groups of the 37 requisites. You hear about them repeated, faculties, um, powers, um, that sort of thing. And you get, so that you are watching them and you're paying, being mindful of what's going wrong and can I stay longer and you're paying attention to them. But those faculties you're paying attention to will turn into powers. And at a certain level on the path, a certain distance down the path, your um, faculties will turn into powers and it means they turn automatic. When they turn automatic, you don't have to think about them anymore. They're gonna balance themselves. This is much the same as playing the early types of games on the computer. Where you, had to, you had to align everything until it was perfectly balanced. And then you could fall into the next level of the game and play some more in the old computer games. Okay. The denourishment of the hindrances. Okay. The denourishment. What bhikkhus is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen sensual desire from arising and from increasing and expanding? Okay, when you're working with the, um, uh, 
the different ones, you find out that you're basically the opposite. So that if you are um, the sign of foulness, frequently giving attention to the denourishment that prevents unarisen sensual desire from arising, you, you start you start reciting the parts of the body. If you want to stop being lustful, you start envisioning and reciting the parts of the body. This is not the cemetery contemplation. This is just the parts of the body. I've done this with several people who had uh, problems in relationships and wanted to figure out what to do about this. And what we do is teach them how to recite the parts of the body a certain way. So it takes them six weeks to do all 31 parts. We teach them how to do that. And um, then they, they, if they practice that, it starts to diminish this push towards lust, too much lust and stuff. And then, then you have another one here of the denourishment that prevents ill will, or un uh, prevents ill will from arising. What do you do to prevent ill will from arising? Everybody should know this one. You practice loving kindness. That's the opposite. So when you're practicing loving kindness, you're preventing thoughts of ill will from arising, which when we read in the book about uh, loving kindness tells us that you abandon the thoughts of ill will when you're practicing uh, the, the loving kindness, okay? Next one is the nourishment for sloth and torpor in arising, uh, the <coughs> sloth and torpor increasing, expanding, what you do, the arousal, the element, the endeavor, uh, the element of exertion, this is just energy. You bring up your energy to counter sloth and torpor. You've heard Bhante say this, when we teach you when you're having suffering sloth and torpor, what do you do? So this is a game of opposites in this section. And then the denourishment of the enlightenment factors. What happens that is the denourishment of the enlightenment factors? The, the denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor from arising, okay, reaching its fulfillment and development, not frequently giving attention to the enlightenment factors. So somebody who thinks they can just learn meditation and go about it without breaking down the parts that go with this deal is just suffering from immediate gratification in modern times. <laughs> That's what I have to say about that. Because we live in a time where we have malls and you don't have to go out for days to find the best <laughs> wagon that you wanna buy um, for the garden, for the, for the vegetable garden, because you can go to the road or to the place in the mall and all the things you could possibly dream are there and you're gonna get everything you need. But when you come to Asia, you have to shop and you have to still go to the road with all the wagons or the road with all the lumber. I love this place, you know, or the road with all the heavens. What is that sound that's going on? It's really fun. <laughs> Somebody has their microphone on. Okay. Okay. Uh, or off. They have their microphone. Now, the next one is hatred. Okay. This one is hatred. I want it mind leads to aversion and uh, the one can get attached to the idea of getting rid of it. Of course, the hindrance also arises with a change of rising tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. That's all the hindrances when they come up, when the, when the hindrances are arising and you're going to fall in. You're going to fall into craving. I don't know what that noise is. Does anybody know? <laughs> um. Uh, Who? It's the vibration from the phone. Oh, okay, okay. Um, there is a personal desire to push this one away and to try to stop it, you know, when you have hatred. Um, but the counter for the hatred and, uh, and, and the cruelty is to come, is to start to practice an opposite. So you start to practice compassion and you will start to counter this, you see? And hatred and aversion do not lead to satisfaction and calm. This is just the facts about it. Instead, they lead to an emotionally active mind 
that's full of more suffering. And uh, I struggle and I suffer and I make things this way. I want them to be that way and so forth. So all of this is uh, uh, when we're talking about the, the sila and, uh, and the hindrances, we're also talking about coming to understand what's happening physically and mentally uh, of how this feels. And we break it down to tension and tightness and we say, when it is an unwholesome mind state coming up, then it's full of tension and tightness. These are the markers Bhante sees as the most clear and that we see the most clear in the students. And when you're letting go, relaxing, smiling, and coming back, let go, relax, smile, come back. There's no reason for you to find out what this hindrance is and where it came from. What's your name and what's your birthday? When did you happen and when did, why did you feel like showing up? And what would you like to wear to my party? And would you like some tea? There's no reason for this, there's no reason. Because the trick to this whole thing is that's not what the Buddha was teaching you to find out. He was teaching you to find out the higher level of understanding, how does this work? And how can I defeat it? So the defeat is really interesting because when we are teaching you the six R's, we're teaching you what the texts are saying instead of what the other side was saying, the commentaries later on, which I think really just slipped back historically to the time when they were doing the heavy concentration before and it was their minds were very, you know, strongly in a very strong point of concentration there's a lot of tension and tightness in this. And when something comes up to try to bother them, big defensive, like, ah, uh, like this. But absolutely no indication in the text that that's what was going on. If you wanna use a, a count or make a bet about this and say, who's gonna win in the gambling table about it? Well, there's two sets of words. The first one is, destroy it, annihilate it, eradicate it, um, suppress it, subdue it, and stop it. But that's not in the text. It's only in one or two suttas out of 152 in, in the Majjhima Nikaya. And we can't find it supported in other ways. But if we go over to look at what the text was saying, it was release it, let it go, relinquish it, allow it. Just leave it alone. And you are the person who can control where the mind's attention is going. If you take away attention, what do you take away from that hindrance? Nutriment. And what is nutriment? Food. So how can you beat the hindrance and win or defeat the hindrance? Take away the supply route for the enemy. <laughs> If you really insist on calling it an enemy, let's go back to the art of war. And what is the way to, the most intelligent way to win the territory of beat the other uh, person and win the war without a battle? He tells you in the 10 points of the art of war, how do you conquer without destroying the people, the land, the people, the people or the land or the mineral rights or everything you need and want to have, how do you win against the other side? You break down the supply route and the army will turn around and go home when they can't get any more food and supplies. They'll go back. And this was brilliant. It was brilliant. These people were crazy before that happened with the art of war. But then he comes and puts together the art of war. And then if you're applying this to anything you're doing in life, can we win without and destroying anybody? What do they really need and what? What do we really need and what? And if they're going to come after us and we understand what's behind the whole thing, can we win? Sure. Take away the nutriment. Next one is dull and sleepy mind. Sloth and torpor, I'm tired. And this is not a physical fatigue. Make sure you remember that. This is not someone saying sleepy dull mind is 
physical fatigue. This one is a favorite mental hiding place everybody has and uses one time or another, and they start drooping and falling and whoops, and the head is bobbing and <laughs> they don't know how to fix something or confess something and forgive yourself and take your precepts again. They don't know how. They don't, wouldn't even think of doing that. Try to remember that you don't have to go to a monk or a nun to take your precepts. They're supposed to be posted on the wall by the door and up on the ceiling above your bed and over by the closet and on the wall in the living room. And you're supposed to embroider them and put them around until you have them inside you all the time. And you say them every morning and you say them in the morning and you keep them through the day. They're your protection to keep you in balance from falling into these other things. So remember a time when you were down about something you felt like things that weren't working as, and as smoothly or as fast as you wanted them to, like in the lockdowns, can you remember experiencing dull mind that set in and then your body wanted to droop over and you even can fall into napping, but it's not because you're exhausted. It's because your brain doesn't want to face what you want it to work with. In meditation, most times this is caused by a slip down in your interest and a slip down in your energy. And you can be corrected by bringing up sharper mindfulness and just using the six R's. And, you know, I don't like this. The personal perspective is at the heart of this once again. Without me, there is no desire for escape. But if we understand the true nature of what's going on here, how the person's perspective really does matter, well, how all of this actually works, then there's a way out of the predicament and the, the way out is to 6R. Okay. Next one is restlessness. And it's sort of like, this is my fault. I'm gonna parry the guilt, blame me and having extended remorse. So during meditation, you can't sit still. This is how this shows up your legs moving, your foot swiggling, or you're moving your body. You just can't stop moving. And in life, when it happens, perhaps it's getting hard for you to sleep. You can't stay on task. Um, this is becoming really irritating. It's usually happening from some kind of guilt or remorse over something that you thought you said or you acted upon. And the solution is just to stop moving at once and six R properly and come back to continuing your meditation. Once again, the reason for it here, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter if you can counter it. Now, if I will tell you this, if it keeps repeating the same exactly way, exact way on any one of these, it comes back and it's repeating, repeating, repeating. That's time to tell us. It's time to tell the guide and say, hey, look, I can't stop this, but it doesn't mean you have to descend to the dark night of the soul. <laughs> you do not have to go in that room. Just close that door, come to us, tell us what's happening. And it might be that this is a kind of blockage and is stopping you from something that you need to forgive. And then we can take you off the meditation, put you on the forgiveness as a cleansing period. And then when you tell us, I, I think I'm clear, you can go back and the meditation will work just fine. But this cleansing practice is not just for a uh, twim. This cleansing practice will help any kind of meditation that's operating. If you have a breathing meditator and he's stuck and you clear it up, they can work too. They're just not going to move as fast. And you know why that is, because they're not going to keep their practice going all the time. They're going to be doing it while they're sitting and using it occasionally in life. Whereas when you're doing the metta, you're used the, the practice of the Brahma Viharas, when once you're working with that, you can use the metta and karuna and upeka all the time, all the time, and start training your brain to the extent that the brain finally understands, I don't want to react anymore. It's too exhausting. <laughs> I would like to respond. Is it okay with you if I respond? And you say to the brain, I love you. It's about time you figured this out. And, and you, let, you, you, you let the brain uh, 
start responding and you find out you have this space now uh, that exists when something happens where you don't have to jump and knee jerk response anymore, react. It's not a knee jerk response, it's a knee jerk reaction. You don't have to do this habitual tendency of reacting. You just stop and see what is essentially going on and then make a decision and then you act, okay? So doubt is the last one. And doubt, what we need, most of the time with doubt, they want to take doubt all over the place. I doubt what I'm wearing. I doubt the seat. I doubt the place. I doubt the food. You know, but really the doubt we're talking about in this precept when you're a meditator is the doubt about how you practice your meditation. Am I following the, the uh instructions perfectly or am I adding a little bit of this and a different kind of butter and a little bit of oil and a new kind of flour and you know and then you expect the same cake to come out but you can't make the cake I made because you won't follow the instructions you would be amazed at what happens here and and how did I learn what that meant I was um <laughs> I was in a big church once and at Christmas time they asked 100 women to make a pound cake and bring it to the center where we had a big conference and they were gonna sell the cake to raise money for an uh, addition for the women, for the, uh, for the youth group to build something in the, on the church, you know? <laughs> and I was receiving the cakes. And when I was receiving these cakes, um, some of them were like, sinking down low and some of them were very high and too dry and some of them were liquidy because they had been taking care of children and not paying attention to the oven or the oven was the wrong temperature they were all different all different and i look back and remember that some were burned they had to change the diapers all of a sudden <laughs> or give the baby a bath and 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 these women all had many children and this was a simple Thing to be done in the loaf pan and they just didn't come out the same. I remember it so clearly. So when I start teaching meditation, Bhante said, well, you know, everybody's not going to do everything the same way. And I didn't know what he meant and went to Indonesia to teach the first time. And I really, honestly, um, everybody was different. And all of a sudden there were 40 people in the room and I had to interview 40 people each day. And everybody's mind was different. I remember sitting there with Brenda. She was trying to help me. We were both trying to figure this out. And I think for me, it was a big shock because I thought I'm going to be fine interviewing. And what happened to me was I went back to him in Missouri and stayed at least another two years just to learn how does he interview and how does this really work and how do you take care of 30 different brains oh my goodness so the whole part here is with doubt you drop off the meditation the mental proliferation begins happening there's a lot of thoughts comparing the practice to something else you add things, you subtract them, but you need to keep TWIM going long enough to see how it really works or not. And I mean, come on, you know, if we can keep you on track for five days, you will definitely taste something that is totally different than anything you've ever done before. And we know now if we can keep you on track for nine days, even if it's online, I can get you to succeed on track up into the aware jhanas and understand how they operate and be in them fairly securely. Uh, if you're in an actual retreat in 10 days, you, you can actually affirm these very strongly, uh, confirm that these are real and boy, I can go home and do this again. And we're talking about something that's matching exactly the descriptions in the text. And so you don't agree with it, that's fine. You know, if you only wanna have a concentration jhana where you climb into a bubble and concentrate as hard as you can and leave the world and can't hear, taste, smell, touch, or feel anymore, you come out, if I gave you a quiz, 
you would not pass the quiz as far as the Dhamma side of everything is concerned because you're trying to get this instant gratification or instant thing to happen, but still they're telling you, you can't get to the jhanas you experience that they're even real and palpable. They're actually there for maybe five years, maybe six years, maybe seven. But we don't understand how that happened because go and read the last page of Sutta number 10, which is Satipatthana Sutta, and read the closing page yourself and tell me, why are they saying that? And then there are certain people who are linked, you know, they're um, basically they're linguists and they are studying literature and prose and they want to say, well, it's just prose the way it's written. It's a form of prose. No, it's not a form of prose. When they repeat things in a sutta for every single sense door, it's a form of drill and training. And no, it isn't prose when they repeat something three times because haven't you ever been to a Christian church for heaven's sakes or a mosque, even a mosque or a Jewish synagogue? They tell you what they're going to say and then they give you the sermon and they say it. And then they tell you what they said and then you all sit down and then you get up and say hello and go home. Was it prose? No, it was something somebody wanted to teach you verbally and have you actually give ear to it and hear it completely and learn it. And it was the same thing back then. This is no different, no different at all. So the repetition in the suttas is there because many of the suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya are drills that the monks were actually supposed to be practicing. And uh, one of the simple ones to show you an, uh, you know, an example of this, to show you an example of it is to teach you what he told the monks they could do about identity in Chichaka Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya number 148. Okay, and in that sutta, in the section on identity, he starts out by saying, if anyone tells you the I is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the I is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. But that is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say the I is self or the form is self or the consciousness is self or the contact is self or the feeling is self or the craving is self. You can't do that because if it arises and passes away and I don't arise and pass away, how can I be it? That's what the Buddha is saying. The next section, he's, they say to him, well, how did this happen? How, how in the world did we get like this? In other words, how did we get so messed up? <laughs> you know, and how we got so messed up in that was basically because we grew up basically around a, a bunch of people uh, that basically said, um, this is the way leading to origination of identity, he says. One regards the I thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And you see people all around you when you're growing up. And it looks like what they see belongs to them. And what you see belongs to you. And something else belongs to someone else. That's what it looks like. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. That's what it looks like. And then the monks say, well, if that's what happened to us, what are we supposed to do? And you get the next section of the sutta. And the next section is the cessation of identity. He gives you the cure. And he says, okay, since you're all messed up, <laughs> this is the way leading to the cessation of this identity. So you can check it out and see how it is. That's what he's saying. One regards the I thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. One regards forms thus, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. And you keep doing this through the six pieces. You see, the nose, the odor, the nose consciousness, the nose contact, the nose feeling, and the, uh, the nose craving. So it's coming from the sense door to the craving. Again, for the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, and, and the mind. 
same thing, mind, mind object, okay, mind consciousness that makes contact, mind contact is conditioned feeling, mind feeling as conditioned craving, mind craving, ah, that's where it goes to craving, okay? And then he starts to explain in that sutta, <laughs> the underlying tendencies that you have ended up with by thinking in the form of identifying things where you have ended up and how that will not, it's impossible for you to reach Nibbana. So that whole section is done six times because there's six sense doors. <clears throat> but you have to go out and spend a day off sometime in the country and start working through what's not possible. And then you start working on what is possible to reach Nibbana. And he tells you exactly how this works. So what, what does he tell you in that one? He tells you, <clears throat> dependent on the I and forms I consciousness arises. Meeting of the three is eye contact. And with contact as condition arises a feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither pleasant nor painful. When one is touched by a pleasant eye feeling, if one does not delight in it, welcome it and remain holding to it. Then the underlying tendency to lust lies, does not lie within one. But when one is touched by a painful feeling, if you do not sorrow, grieve and lament, you do not weep or beat one's breast and become upset, then the underlying tendency to aversion does not lie within you. When one is touched by a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, if one understands as it actually is, the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape from that kind of feeling. Yeah, I missed up with it. In regards to that feeling, then the underlying tendency to ignorance does not lie within one. Monks that one shall hear and now make an end of suffering by abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant feeling, by abolishing the underlying tendency to aversion towards a painful feeling, by extirpating the underlying <laughs> tendency to ignorance in regards to a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, this is possible. Wow. So he's telling you what you need to learn. What do you need to learn? How the phenomena arise, how they originate, how they disappear. Impersonally, not part of you at all. You don't make it happen. Ar arise, how they, uh, the origination and disappearance. Gratification, how do I personally get involved with those feeling that arises, right? The danger of it, what's the danger of it? If the beautiful girl walks into the office and you're trying to get the last report done before the board meeting <laughs> and you have to just let go of it, and you get involved, how do you get involved? You, you're lost in attention and I like this. And you're thinking that you're going away from it. So you let it go, you six R, you, you let go, relax, smile, come back, laugh at yourself because you got caught. And then you come back and finish your work. And then it isn't a danger, but the danger was it would take you out of the present moment from what you're doing and get you going in a direction away from your work. And that's the danger of it. And he says he found this, the escape. I like the sutta because he says the last one you have to learn is the escape. What's the escape? Right effort. The operation of right effort, right observation, and right amount of collectedness. <clears throat> okay so whenever you break a precept how do these hindrances affect your meditation at the time that you have lust and greed and hatred and aversion in your heart the after effect shows up later as an arising hindrance this is how it works 
like restlessness, dull sleepy mind, guilt, remorse, anxiety, can change sleep patterns, can get really tired. Hindrances do not necessarily come up one at a time either. Remember that. They can gang up on you. Um, if you kill an animal and you come home, you might not sleep. You might have restlessness and have sloth and torpor at work. There's any number of combinations. When I made that chart for you guys one time, we were teaching you dependent origination. We gave you, look at the situation and tell me how it works across the chart. What happens with hindrances? So what can be done about these hindrances? You learn how they actually work, just like the art of war. And you're told exactly how they work in the text. And then through your harmonious practice, applying right effort, which is the Buddha's own system to replace the hindrances with a wholesome meditation until they naturally fade away. That's your answer. He teaches you how to purify your mind. The proper way to deal with the hindrances is to recognize as early as possible when they are coming up with the rising tension, using that as the symptom in the mind and body, release any attention off of the hindrance and relax all tension and tightness left in your head caused by it. And then just let it be there and you gently smile and return to your meditation object or whatever task that you're doing in life. I have doctors, I have lawyers, I have judges who are doing this, it really works effectively. And all hindrances naturally pass away if they are not fed nutriment. Personal attention is their nutriment. A hindrance will not increase if I do not personally give it the nutriment. And the, therefore, whenever the hindrance arises, we get to witness how the wrong idea of a self and a personal perspective happens and causes suffering every single time. So you think about this and you understand the angle, you figure out, whoops, how it works. You figure out the teachers uh, can do this and help you by seeing what you can't see. The benefit to have, being a Samanera and staying with a teacher for a couple years is you give them permission to point to your shadow. That sounds funny, but I can't see my shadow behind me, but the teacher who's with me can see the shadow. It means he can see my craving when I can't identify it. And they pick on you <laughs> constantly and they point it out and then you acknowledge it and you watch it more closely and more closely. But we don't do that today. We become a summoner and we walk around, do whatever we want sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes in the West this happens. And then sometimes we then get ordained by a teacher. And then again, we'd assume we know everything. So we go to Canada, get some land and we start teaching somewhere, but we don't know what we're teaching, but we're going to say it in our own words and say it from the heart. And this is Buddhism. This is what's happening. In a lot of times, this is what's happening. It's hard. So these arising hindrances have to do with karma. But we're gonna talk about karma in another place. But the one thing I want you to remember about karma is my little term called the karmic, karmic kickback. <laughs> that means if somebody poke, you poke somebody, you can expect to be poked back. If you trick somebody, you can, effect, uh, you can watch in the future to see if anybody tries to trick you the same way as you trick someone else. If you steal something, you're gonna lose something in the future. If you get money dishonestly, it's not going to stick around. Maybe, maybe 24 hours, maybe, maybe a week, but it'll disappear. How should we best protect ourselves from hindrances? Don't break the precepts at any time in your life. If you want to purify and retrain your brain into a wholesome direction, then do it all the time. Why am I saying that? Well, uh, once my best route for you to get to quickly get there, I checked last week, it's still that way. You put in the computer at Google, you put in, how do I change a habit if I'm over 25 years old? And as you're looking at some of those little research summaries that are in there for this, you're gonna find out they always talk about how do you train a brain? That's what these research, um, about habit, habitual act reactions was about. And the way that you train a brain to have a new 
neural pathway is you have to do things exactly the same way every single time. So when you do your six R's, you do them exactly the same way every single time. You don't change the way they are, like thinking, I'm going to get to the brain more effectively if I say it this way, then that way, then that way. You're only going to confuse the brains. So whoever is living up there <laughs> is, um, is only wanting to hear a serious directive that you really want to have happen. It only wants you to tell it the same way every single time. And then it begins to think it's very important. And then it lets go of the old habit and replaces it with the new habit and starts building a new neural pathway for that direction when you're talking about a habit and habitual tendencies. So the thing about Buddhism, what is the practice all about in relationship to transcending suffering in life? And this is a good question. What in the world does Buddhism transcend? It transcends the unwholesome mind states and all that goes with it on that side into the wholesome side. And it allows you to test in your life how this is going to go if you stay on that side. So you, in order to grow from Buddhism, it's all about change and it's up to you how much change happens from pursuing the meditation and, and the support teachings by how willing you are to follow the directions precisely and keep doing it until they lock in and see what that's like. And it's amazing. It's amazing. And the three characteristics of existence, Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta, those are experienced and fully comprehended and applied um, to get free from suffering every time we practice the six R's. And that's something else we'll do in another lesson, but there are some diagrams that I used to show people, you know, how this is working uh, with the dependent origination and with an Anicca, Dukkha, and Nata, because if you learn the dependent origination in a way where you can use it in life all the time, the seven link work, uh, page that we give you, those seven links out of the 12 links, you can follow where the Anicca is really important and where the Dukkha is, how the suffering actually happens, and that the Anatta is how you get out of it. The Anatta is the impersonal nature of everything and then using it. So all things are impermanent, change goes on all the time. That's Anicca. Dukkha is all our mental and physical suffering due to our unsatisfactoriness with such constant and continual change. And anatta is the impersonal nature of everything, okay? And the proper perspective for release from such suffering in daily life. And you learn about these within their, uh, within their own lesson as we go along. And the Buddha Dhamma opens the way for people to have hope, development, future change, space for creative ideas, and learn that what we think and ponder on, that becomes the inclination of our mind. When I was a um, personnel consultant, someone said to me, how do you become an expert? I want to become an expert because if you're an expert this or an expert that, look how much money you make. <laughs> and I said, well, to become an expert at something, you have to decide what you want to do and you like it. If you like it, you're going to do well at it, but you find out what you love and you do what you love and love what you do. And then if you stay there and keep doing that, you slowly become this expert. That's the only way. You have to do that and nothing else. This is stretching it right now today because everybody gets so concerned with money and they jump from job to job and they're never there long enough to become an expert. I don't care what the job is or how much you're being paid. It doesn't work the same way as when you had discipline to take a track and really see if you could become an expert in that track. But don't stay there if you don't like it. If it's sucking you dry of energy and killing your life, you get off the train. It's not good. Find something that leads to something that you like doing because when you were in school, whatever you liked was your highest grade in school. 
So concerning the suffering causing by the hindrances, you're saying there is a choice. This is the question that Q asks. And of course, there's a choice. There's a beautiful choice in foundation Buddhism leading to the immediate temporary cessation of suffering in daily life. And that choice is your personal responsibility. And I'm talking about the six R's. You may hold on to the heat of the struggling of the hindrances by craving and clinging to them in your mind and suffer more deeply. Or you may see how you are taking things too personally, recognizing this, release it, you release it, relax, smile, and come back to meditating or to your job or to whatever you're doing or to your driving. I don't care what it is. And each time you let go and relax, you are truly alive in that moment. And it's just like you were born again, like you were young again. When you look around you, you are without stress or personal concern. You're free from any craving and heat of craving. You're just being again. And then because you are seeing this exists, it is a growing knowledge and vision practice. The Buddha was different in his teaching because he would not accept the plan for the day of training. That means the Brahmin system of I hear the Veda, I recite the Veda the same way it was recited to you back seven or 10 generations and I just recite it and recite it, recite it. I experienced some 15 year olds who were studying the Upanishads and the Vedas in New York state. I asked them about the class and they described it exactly the same way that it is described in the Chanki Sutta in 95. And so what's different about this and what the Buddha is teaching is he is saying to you in the beginning, please don't even believe me when I, my job is to point to show you how to connect the dots to show you how you are able to make this practice work completely, but it's up to you. And if you fall off the track and you're in contact, you say, this isn't working, before you give it up and throw it away, call me on the phone or call, send me an email and tell me what happened. Because I can usually see right away how you added the wrong ingredient or took away one or shifted or didn't exactly do one of the steps the right way. It's the problem, with twim somebody said why isn't it famous if you want the truth we live in a very competitive time a very macho time where you have to be the best in the top of your craft we want to get there first and say it with mine and i made it happen that's why you know we want to do it that way and we have all these blocks from acquisition and competition in this day and age worldwide we're pushing, you see? And here the Buddha comes along and he says, if you wanna learn meditation to get complete control of your life, you're not gonna like it. But if I teach you and I say, okay, I'm gonna help you to let go of all control so that you can finally see how everything actually works essentially, the truth of the true nature of everything. And then you're going to gain control like nobody else has. And that's the truth. Because you will understand completely how everything works. And that's, that's what my, the students feel who keep going with this, who get into the higher levels. That's what they tell us. And it's true. So this should encourage you to test everything. He wanted you to question. And his methodology was back here Knowledge and vision of how things work is the cornerstone for knowledge and wisdom. And he tells it in several suttas, you cannot learn this by reading alone or just talking alone with each other. It's something you have to see to understand, experience to verify and say it is real. You can't kid me if you say you know this, you know that, you read one of the books and say, well, I did this, I did that. Sure you did. Let me be with you for a month <laughs> and tell what's really going on. You can't keep doing it. Can't keep hiding and fooling around with it. It's very real and it happens naturally. When you are keeping your precepts, you are protecting yourself from unwanted arising hindrances that occur in life during meditation whenever a precept is broken. But these also happen in life. 
And by following the precepts closely, they reduce and eventually they stop altogether. It isn't as difficult as we first thought once we understood exactly what they are, what causes them and how they operate and how they can be released, our mindfulness observation can be restored and we begin to see the truth even more deeply than we did before. So continuous use of right effort is training the brain uh, that leads us all the way in Buddhist meditation to the cessation of suffering and to the mind opening experience of the liberation of mind and we say Nibbana. And understanding this interrelationship between the precepts and hindrances, maybe I'm hoping that you begin to see why I get a little distressed when they're trying to teach them separately as two dry subjects that aren't connected and you might accidentally figure out there's a, a relationship when they're really almost conjoined in the way they operate. And so it's a tit for tat system. There's a couple of references at the end of this. I wanna find you now desperately. Wait a second, let me try to find you. I might have to go out and come in again because I can't figure out how to change page. Um, let me do it real quick. Okay. 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 Oh, that was easy. All I had to do was close that. <laughs> Finally. Okay. All right. Now, does anybody have any questions? I'm not even sure what time it is. Let's see. It is 8.45. <laughs> okay. I know it was longer than I planned, but um, there's a drawing with this, but I sort of hesitate to show you the drawing because I did a drawing. And um, how many people want uh, if I see the people, if you raise your hand, how many of you want to have the, the parts want to have, make note of the, uh, make note of the sutta references that seemed pretty much in, in keeping with this whole thing. Do you want to, you want to hear the list? Okay. All right. Um, I can one, two, three, four, how many others? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the sutta and the verse, and you're going to have to go dig for this yourself. But this, we, we, I did a research on virtue and behavior and conduct. And so this is what we came up with today. Um, go to, um, mm -hmm. one interesting aspect was 24.2, 24.2. Which page is that? Majima Nikaya number 24, and if I say point two, I mean the second section. This one is, is giving the message you only teach if you're teaching. This is a note for teachers. Only teach what you have known by seeing. This is the Buddhist direction to his monks before they teach. When he was training them in his school, do not teach what you have not seen and know by seeing. And it's an extension of knowledge and vision. And he doesn't want you to start trying to explain something that you do not know with, you know, you have not seen. And then, um, um, fourteen is um, right view is what it is, is right perspective. And when we say perspective, that's how you see the world. So if you're new here, that's how you see the world. And the correct perspective, um, the, the way you're supposed to see it, it's supported by five factors and virtue is one of the supporting factors. For you to be able to see the world in the proper view, you have to have uh, your virtue in place. And the five supporting factors were virtue. These are what's important. Virtue is one. Learning is two. Discussion is three. Serenity and insight is four and five. Now in this practice, 
what you're examining is the possibility of having a serenity and insight practice where serenity and insight are yoked together. They're pulling together. And somebody said to me uh, once, that's ridiculous. They can't pull together if they're like this. And I said, you're right. I never saw two horses, one on top of the other one, try to pull the wagon. <laughs> they can't pull the wagon like that. I said they were yoked together like this. And then they pull the wagon together equally. You see? And this is pointed out to us in a number of places. And this one, one place it was referring to too. But if you go there, you'll see there are these five factors that support you. And then for those of, there's a few of you, I don't know if, if Sarm is here, but if he's not, or if he is here, but um, he speaks in praise of conduct, 32.7. 32.7 speaks with praise of the forest and speaks with praise of the alms food and speaks with praise of the refuse wearer and of the three robes monk and um, has few wishes for the self and content they speak of their contentment. They are secluded and speak well of seclusion. They are aloof from the society and they praise this aloofness and they're energetic. They're praising energy and eating properly and exercising properly so they have good energy and they are, virtue is, intact, virtue is solid and precise and they praise the virtue, living in virtue and the collectedness is the balanced mind. So he's showing the advanced meditator who wants to separate themselves and test seclusion, what these components all have to be there together in order to go all the way through. And um, that's at 32, 7. 44, 11. 44, 11 was... Um, talking about sila samadhi and panya okay and this is virtue collectedness balanced mind, balanced concentration or balanced collectedness and wisdom is sila samadhi panya the sila is trying to in this sutta comes out the sila is one of the pillars that holds the roof up you can't remove it you have to have that protection. It's a pillar supporting the collectedness and supporting the wisdom. And then the wisdom is occurring because of the collectedness. When I read the sutta through a couple of times, I realized, you know, uh, I'm, I'm looking at something this year. I'm looking for causal relationships between groups. It's my new hobby. <laughs> so in other words, if you have... I'll, Ardika, this is like if you have um, uh, fem qua, you say faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Okay, when he, it's it's. Uh, I'm trying to investigate: is it written in that order because it's causal, or is it okay for a new teacher to come and be smart about it and change the order? For instance, of Anicca Dukkha Anatta. And the answer is, don't ever do that. A new teacher once wrote a book and he said, well, what's the big deal about Anicca Dukkha Anatta? He said, let's just say Anatta Dukkha and, uh, and the other one, what is it? And wait a minute, Anicca Dukkha Anatta. And he wanted to say Anatta Anicca Dukkha. Well, but when you do that, you lose what the order was telling you. The Anicca is the change and the unsatisfactory from the change is the dukkha and the solution for the dukkha is the anita the anatta the impersonal adopting the impersonal perspective not taking anything personally anymore get it so now if you change it and you say anatta well then you could you could mess everything up because then they would say, you know, they defined that as um, self and no self. So if this is no self, let's see, no self, 
<laughs> There's no causal relationship anymore. So what I started doing was taking the 37 requisites of enlightenment and drawing them on a chart and looking at them for a while, like a half hour, 40 minutes, and then seeing something that was I didn't find before. And this is what's fun. You do this. You know, I've been doing this 20 years. I never saw this before. And all of a sudden, I'm realizing if I look at, um, you know, body, feeling, mind, and dhammas, for instance, you have to have a body. And then you would look at what's happening with feeling and how it affects your body. That makes sense. So there's the pasana right there, you see. That made sense. And then mind, what's it have to do with it? Well, mind is the forerunner of everything, but mind's involved. So you try to see if this one, those four have a causal relationship that you can speak to. And then you take the five faculties and then you take the seven factors of enlightenment. Try it with that. Seven factors of enlightenment. And mindfulness is the observation of that's how you learn and you can't learn anything unless you do the investigation but you did the investigation because you wanted to find out so mindfulness investigation energy well if you don't have energy you can't do the investigation right so you need the energy so do these have causal relationships this is fun you should try it <laughs> this is fun all right next one is 48.6 now, these are very nice, and Bhante taught you about these. He, this is Kasambian Sutta, and inside the Kasambian Sutta, there, is, there are six principles of cordiality. This should be on everybody who has a business. This should be up on the wall for the employees to see it, okay? First one is love and respect. Those, uh, that's two, okay. Uh, women, is that right? Women, two. Love and respect conduces to cohesion, to non dispute, to concord, and to unity. So you have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Love, respect. Cohesion, non-dispute, concord, and unity. That's pretty good. I would love to have an office that was operating that way or a ward in the hospital that was operating that way or maybe a manufacturing company that was operating that way. That'd be great. Then if you go in, you always find really neat things in 53, and that is the Seka Sutta. And, and that one is higher training, the higher training, the description of the higher training. So it was at what, 53.7? 53.7, and he's taken you there before. He's taken you there before. And um, it starts out <clears throat> what it's examining in seven and keep going down a little bit more in, beyond that. Seven is he's possessed of virtue. And then eight is how does one complete the virtue? And the next one, uh, and how, how um, you do it by knowledge or by forcing yourself to, to change, forcing yourself to change. And it goes down, you go from uh, seven to 10, seven through 10. And then it takes you through a system of, um, development of faith, uh, development of fear of wrongdoing and shame, Hiri and Otapa. And then you learn much. This is what you're supposed to be doing when you're learning. He's telling you now what you're supposed to be doing when we're in these classes. How are we supposed to be doing this? We're learning much. Then we learn much and remember it, recite it verbally, investigate it with the mind, and penetrate it well by view. And what did view mean? View was perspective. And what is perspective? Impersonally, we investigate it and penetrate it impersonally when it says 
do penetrate it well by view. You don't have any opinion, don't judgment it. You try to see it, how it essentially is happening. And then it talks about he has mindfulness at 16. And then he is wise. He possesses. Now watch this. You know what we say wisdom means in Buddhist texts. What does it refer to? It refers to dependent origination. Listen to this. He is wise. He possesses wisdom regarding the rise and the disappearance that is noble and penetrative and leads to the complete destruction of suffering. Ooh, wow. I would say that's a confirmation of the way that we're teaching you because we're teaching you to understand that the dependent origination is there because you're supposed to be looking at the origination, the disappearance, how you get involved with it, the danger of it, and what the escape from the suffering is. And here it's saying this is where the wise thing comes. There's a couple other places. It's in 44 too. It's there too. That is how a noble student possesses seven good qualities. So he had seven good qualities there. Okay. That was, um, what was that? 53. Okay. Then 78, 11. Uh, Samana Mandika Sutta. 10 through 13. You, you know, you can go from section 10 through 13. <clears throat> and what we're seeing here is we're seeing right effort, and then there's a section between it and right effort again. So you see the practice to reach the highest level and have the suffering cease without remainder. Cease without remainder. And the only way it can cease without remainder is if you keep choosing the other side and you keep choosing the alternative. You're contradicting, embrace the contradiction, right? Next one is 81.18. Okay, <clears throat> this is Kasapa talking. <clears throat> and Kasapa is speaking of his story with the potter Gatikara, he's a supporter, and um, talking about what happened, Gatikara is telling Kasapa the story. He's the potter, and he's telling Venerable Kasapa the story. What happened when he kept feeding the monks? No matter what, he kept feeding the monks. Even if he was going out of town, he fed the monks. He left the food at the gate in the pot, or he came out and gave it from the door of the house. He kept feeding them all the time. What happened? And that's one place you need to go find right now. And then uh, 104, section 21, reconfirms the six principles of cordiality again. So that is a referral suited to the other one. And then 108, section 14, this one, he's saying the virtue pertains to the practitioner because he is perfect in concord and resort. That means he's perfect in how he behaves around the other monks, that's his concord and Resort. How does he resort to get, how does he get what he needs to survive? How does he do it? Is he in keeping with the patimoka for the rules for the monks? And then you go to 125.15. And when this person is practicing, how disciplined um, how disciplined are the are, is the person the virtue has to be intact and the person in order to reach the level of the cessation the neuroda the person must go through a level of experience where they see the slightest fault they see it and they let it go. 
And this is your six R's. If you're working with your six R's, you get through this fine because you're keeping your precepts and you're practicing your six R's. And you see the slightest fault and you, you let it go. And then 142.3. And this is, this is interesting. The reason I noted this is because I'm a nun, but <laughs> you know, this is about Maha Pajapati, the venerable Maha Pajapati. And she was the, uh, the, the aunt of the Buddha who raised him when his mother died. Okay. And Maha Pajapati, she became a Narahat. We know this. And she, um, the reason she became an arahat so easily was because she kept her precepts perfectly. And I had an experience in, in uh, North Carolina with Bhante a number of years ago. We had a retreat in a Thai temple and we had about um, maybe 12, 15 people, not a big retreat. And one of the women who came who was a greener I say she's green. She has no knowledge of meditation, no experience at all, never read a book, never listened to a Dhamma talk at all. She comes to the retreat, and in two days, she's in the fourth jhana. How did she do that? It was like, and I was just learning, you know, at the level where I was getting, thinking maybe I would teach someday. And I said, to, I went, I had did an interview. He said to, check in, if she wanted to check in, let her check in. And if I knew where she was to go, tell him. And so I went over to the house, but I was scratching my head. Like, how could this happen? That she became a, like into the fourth jhana, like in two days. How could that happen with a greener? Because we had had many people green come in before, but why is this happening? And, and then he came over and he, he hadn't seen her yet. And he saw how she was dressed. And I said, yeah, well, I thought it was okay to let her do that. And he said, it's fine, but look at it. She was wearing um, a twin bed sheet, a white twin bed sheet. And she put it on the right way. How did she know? Not, she didn't ask us and she didn't ask the monks. How did she know how to put the sheet on the right way so it wouldn't fall off? And so, we asked her about her precepts. I listened to him do this interview and, he, and she said, I have never broken a precept in my life. And that there, right there, that is why this happened this way. Plus the other thing is she came, it came from somewhere else. This is a throwback, obviously it's a throwback. And um, so from some other lifetime, she was meditating. She sat perfectly. You didn't have to tell her anything, but everybody knew she had never done anything like this before, ever. And there you go, just like that. And this is, okay, <laughs> okay, fine. And, I, and, and, uh, I, and what happened was he came around the corner. I was standing in the pantry in the house, this old house, and he was interviewing them in the kitchen. And when he came around the corner, I said, so was she in the fourth genre? Really? And he went like this. He said, I wanted to slap her on the head. <laughs> How did she do that? <laughs> he was joking with me. He said, I want to slap her on the head. Like, how did you do that? And what it was when he thought about it himself, how many years did it take him to be able to get into this discovery, but then still work to fall in, you see? And she had this amazing path that she was walking. And uh, she's really wonderful. She's a music teacher. Okay, then that's, that's a, enough to give you, um, give you um, a basis, a little things, you know, to look up until we go to the weekend. And then we're going to look at a sutta that backs it up I still have to figure out which one we're going to use, but we're going to go through a sutra that backs it up. Now, how, how much time do you all have? I don't know what time. Bhante, Bhante, where are we with time? Can I do the drawing or not? Uh, no, I think uh, we are already, uh, it is nine. We are already. Uh, okay, we're, well, we're over. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just love to teach this, but okay. Um, 
Oh, I had one more for you. I'm sorry. I didn't see that one. Where did that one come from? Anyway, there's 15 factors for good conduct. 15 factors for good conduct, okay? Um, and the way you get 15, um, you guard the six sense doors. You do not try to stop them from operating. You never try to stop them from operating. You guard them, which means you stay on the wholesome side. And if something pulls you away with one of your sense doors when you're meditating, you use the six R's. But in daily life, you guard them. But it doesn't mean you put them in a dungeon and lock them up with chains. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. It just means that you guard your sense doors, understanding that you can get caught with something you, you see, hear, smell, taste, or touch or think, so you have to be careful, okay? By the way, I'm not saying don't indulge in daydreaming ever, because it's kind of fun, <laughs> you know? But if that's what you're going to do for an hour, you can let yourself go and see what happens. And when you actually are developing, you'd be surprised how that changes, if, uh, too, you know, if you just do it once a month. All right, seven, uh, moderate, you, you are moderate in your eating, Okay, that's seven, okay. Um, the eighth one is you're devoted to wakefulness. Devoted to wakefulness. Adequate sleep, not too much, not too little. And, um, and then at will, you practice to obtain without trouble. You obtain at will without trouble. So this means um, mastery. mastery, mastery determinations. We, we call this mastery of determinations. You obtain at will and without trouble the four jhanas. Now, when I say to you this way, remember when I say you obtain at will without any trouble the four jhanas, I'm talking about all eight jhanas. Does everybody understand that? That includes all eight jhanas because infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothing and neither perception or non-perception are not five, six, seven, and eight. They are sub uh, mental states for the fourth jhana. That's just a modern terminology to talk about eight jhanas. But that's what you see nowadays. You usually see talk about the eight jhanas. And they do have breakdown descriptions in the texts when we talk about what happens in each level. There's no problem with that. I just want you to understand that those are some they're saying here. So that's 15 good qualities. All right. And then on Saturday, I will give you the drawing. I will try to come early into the room so I don't have to agonize with trying to do it in front of you. <laughs> But I'll tell you what the drawing is about so you can begin to understand uh, that um, understand that he was trying to create a tapestry that was like on a on a, a weaving loom. And so what we're gonna do on Saturday is pretend that we're building a loom. And I, I have agonized over this for a number of years, uh, trying to establish what would the design be on the quilt if we made a loom and we wove this again. So what are we weaving? We're going to weave the Dhamma cloth. And in it, we have to include the pieces that are the most important pieces that you can't leave out. So this would be the lesson from birth to death in the present time, and what does past and future and present mean, and what is a noble eightfold path, and what are the four uh, noble uh, the four noble truths, and what are the twelve pieces of dependent origination, and the seven factors of enlightenment, the thirty-seven requisites of enlightenment. Oh, they all have to be in the quilt. So when you think about this, you're looking at. Uh, a tapestry, like if you look in the, on the internet, look up the um, 
the French tapestry designs in the 17th century at Versailles. If you look that up, you're going to, you're going to be able to see these tapestries that have remarkable pieces of information in the tapestry, like this does behind me here. You see, if this was a tapestry, if I lived here, I probably would start labeling these things that are on the wall <laughs> and start calling, you know, like there's the four noble truths and you see what I'm saying? So I don't know why this got started with me, but I used to work in my church, I used to attend what's called a quilt bee in the Western United States. And everybody sits around the table and we're all working on the same quilt. And we're trying to make it and then we give it to somebody who's getting married who doesn't have anything as their marriage quilt at the church or we uh, sell it to raise money for something in the church that we want to do. So that's the kind of thing we used to do. So all of this is about the Buddha Dhamma, the suffering, the cessation of suffering, the basic knowledge antidotes, and it's revealing the complete comprehension of the Dhamma, meaning it deeply reveals. When we say complete comprehension of the Dhamma, what does it mean? Deeply reveals to the point where you can explain it completely the Four Noble Truths, Dependent Origination, how to see it and use it, and the fullest understanding of Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta. There you go. That was my whole day's work before everybody came to the door before I came to you tonight. <laughs> that was really wonderful. Okay. And it was so funny, I asked several people, please don't call me, because one person in particular calls me at about 5.30 before these classes. And I called them and I said, please don't call me anymore on Wednesdays or Saturdays before this class. And I thought I had all this under control and I was gonna come in here and I had half an hour and then the doorbell rang, the phone rang, another person came, it was amazing. And I'm just in the lab. And the more I saw myself going, how am I gonna set this all up? in my bar stool on the kitchen table. <laughs> How am I going to do this in time? And then Bhante called me, and as soon as I heard Bhante Dhammagavesi's voice, he pulled me down to earth again, <laughs> and I got it done. So you had a class, and I'm glad. So I want to thank you very much. And you have questions. Yeah. Write your questions down or mail them to me so I can answer them on Saturday. Send me questions, but send it to kantikema2 at gmail.com, okay? Okay? Promise? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to say our prayer. Here we go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they surely protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.